Thank you very much for that review. That's very helpful. Um, I actually work in the Protocol Service Center for the NHGRI, and we help with protocol development for IRB review and FDA submissions. So um, it's wonderful to know that other people are doing the same kind of thing in such an expansive way. So uh, my question for Helena is, um, considering the experience and expansiveness of your shop, do you actually take advantage of the pre-submission process, or are, do you all already know it all? You don't even bother. You don't Absolutely. You straight, straight to the... To oh, the I mean, there is no way that we know it all. First of all, I, second, I'm not sure that someone working in an academic institution that has so many people from different departments contacting you can say that you know it all, plus everything is always evolving. So I, I really would also say that, that our easiest submission and most smooth rights were when we contacted FDA. Uh, if anything, our challenge was to um, persuade investigators that, because you know, you always have these situations when someone who knows someone had a bad experience um, and they don't want to talk, that really that's the best and the, if you want, most cost-effective way because you're ensuring that you're not doing experiments that afterwards will not be accepted as a part of your submission. So pre-submission meeting is what we really encourage everybody to have. And I have a, a second question. Um, there's been a lot of talk within IND uh, universe about expanded access. And I haven't heard anything about expanded access in, in regards to IDEs. And I was just wondering, do you even see that? Is that even a, a, a possibility within the IDE arena? Uh, yes, we do have it at Duke, and we did have a couple of emergency IDEs. Um, we have that as a part of a training program, and actually I sent some of the slides to Rebecca so she might post. Um, if you, just a short description, that it would be very similar logic and uh, structure as uh, expanded access for INDs. So what we had is two, three expanded access emergency IDEs, but not uh, single patient, not, I mean, um, compassionate use in the others. Not so it was emergency use. Emergency use. Yes. yes. E emergency use, well, it's, it was single patient, but it was emergency use ID. Which can you give an example? Yes. Just generally, what, what yeah. is that? What does it look like? Uh, I can give you two on top of my head. One was that we needed to, emer to have emergency use for um, column that is not FDA approved for cell sorting. There was a kid, pediatric uh, patient coming to Duke, and so it was emergency within a few days, um, for which we had it on unauthorized to in order to provide cells for a patient for cell therapy, we needed to make this unauthorized use of um, column for cell sorting. So that was one example. And the other one, that there was a cardia cardiac patient. So the device itself was already run under an IDE, but in different indication for different situation. When entering the OR, a physician knew that this might not go well, and they came with that device kind of prepared that they might need to use that as a life-saving treatment, which it was. Um, in both cases, so these were two simple examples that I can remember. I'm sure there were more, but I, these are two that I was involved at least. What I can say in the, both cases, it was very important that we contacted IRB and let them know, give them heads up, and we do have emergency IRB number. I'm sure that every IRB has it. And there is also on the FDA website um, emergency number or something like that. Maybe it's not called emergency, but something like that. Number that you can call and the real person will either answer or return your call in a very very quickly, because actually for that first scenario that I just, or case that I just uh, described, the it was like Friday, it was catching weekend, the kid was coming on Monday, so we really tried to solicit some sort of feedback. It's not approval, but at least you try to let FDA know what will be, what, what's going to happen. Thank you. A while back, some folks at CDRH collaborated with some folks in the clinical proteomics research network at NCI to put together a publication that was basically um, a model pre-IDE or model IDE submission that was then published in the Cancer Research Journal, which is something that we've been able to point people to, you know, to give them an idea of what's involved if it's a whole new um, idea for them. Any thoughts about doing that for NGS or for any other platform? 
Yeah, so uh, actually that case was a, a Mach 510K, so a Mach, 5, Mach IDE would be even easier. Um, but yeah, we've just, that's something we've discussed, and um, uh, just I, I do think it would be good. I mean, I think it sort of illustrates one of the challenges, which is that it is, you know, because IDEs are not public, um, there are no examples. So like when you're starting to work on it, what do you, you know, you have no template. You don't have, don't have an example. So to the degrees that we can get even a, um, uh, you know, a contrived example out there, I think it would be very helpful. So I think that is something we've discussed and, you know, we will certainly think about, you know, trying to get one of those going. It's, it's I think it's a good idea. Are there any um, online questions? Anyone else? Perhaps we can take our hypothetical case studies and make them into the hypothetical mock ID. ID. So, all right. I'd rather get them as a mock one than a real one. <laughs> all right. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and just a quick wrap up of the day. I think we. I think this was a pretty successful and informative workshop. Um, all of the materials will be available online, including the supplemental materials that were mentioned throughout the day. And we'll get those up as soon as possible next uh, next week. We'll be creating a summary of the workshop as well that will be available. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers who traveled and and we're all on of our all on all of our pre workshop calls. Um, our colleagues at FDA. And then finally, it takes a lot of people to put a workshop like this together. There was a lot of NHGRI staff involved. We borrowed from different branches, the genomics healthcare branch, the communications people who arrived at 6.30 this morning to set up for, for the webcast, and, um, and also finally the entire policy branch who was all hands on deck who helped prepare it behind, uh, early and were present today. And then finally to Rebecca Hong, who there would be no workshop without Rebecca. So <laughs> thank you, everyone, and miss the traffic. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>